Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our service for this morning. Whether you're here in St. Peter's or whether you're watching this at home on our Facebook page or website, it's great to be joining with you in worship today. Although, if you're at home, uh, you may not yet realise that this, in fact, is a pre recorded service because I'm not actually looking out on anyone in church this morning. Um, I'm up at, actually up at St. Oswald, so this is all of a pre recorded uh, service. Uh, this morning, but whether you're at home or in church, it's great to welcome you uh, today. So we're going to begin with a moment of quiet, and then I'm going to say a prayer that reminds us why we have uh, come to worship God this morning, and then I'm going to lead us in a prayer of confession uh, before we sing our opening hymn. So let's just uh, be quiet for a moment, uh, whether we're in church or at home, and recognise God's presence with us. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And so as we begin our service this morning, we remind ourselves that we have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. So as it says there in that prayer of introduction, let us come before God this morning, recognising those ways in which we've fallen short of his purposes for our lives, recognising his love for us and his desire to forgive us. And so let us just spend a moment in quiet as we begin our service this morning, coming before God. Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. I'm going to lead us in a prayer of confession. Let us pray. God our Father, long suffering, full of grace and truth. You create us from nothing and give us life. You give your faithful people new life. You do not turn your face from us, nor cast us aside. We confess that we have sinned against you and our neighbour. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. Restore us for the sake of your Son, and bring us to heavenly joy, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins, and restore us in his image, to the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song will we praise our God. And we're going to indeed worship God by having our opening song, which has been recorded for us by the music group. It's Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. So if you're at home, please do join in with the words. They'll be on the screen. Those of us are in church, are obviously going to be worshipping silently now to the hymn Love Divine or Love's Excelling. Thanks in us, my heart 
two sons. He went to the elder one and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. I don't want to, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. Yes, sir, he answered, but he did not go. Which one of the two did what his father wanted? The elder one, they answered. So Jesus said to them, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John the Baptist came to you showing you the right path to take, and you would not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. Even when you saw this, you did not later change your minds and believe him. Listen to another parable, Jesus said. There was once a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence round it, dug a hole for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he let out the vineyard to tenants and went on a journey. When the time came to gather the grapes, he sent his slaves to the tenants to receive his share of the harvest. The tenants seized his slaves, beat one, killed the other, and stoned another. Again, the man sent other slaves, more than the first time. 
and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. Surely they will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the owner's son. Come on, let's kill him and we will get his property. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Jesus asked. He will certainly kill those evil men, they answered, and let the vineyard out to other tenants, who will give him his share of the interest of the harvest at the right time. Jesus said to them, Haven't you ever read what the scriptures say? The stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out to be the most important of all. This was done by the Lord. What a wonderful sight it is. And so I tell you, added Jesus, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce the proper fruits. The chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables and knew that he was talking about them. So they tried to arrest him. But they were afraid of the crowds who considered Jesus to be a prophet. Jesus again used parables in talking to the people. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Once there was a king who prepared a wedding feast for his son. He sent his servants to tell the invited guests to come to the feast, but they did not want to come. So he sent other servants with this message for the guests. My feast is ready now. My bullocks and prized calves have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But the invited guests paid no attention and went about their business. One went to his farm, another to his shop, while others grabbed the servants, beat them and killed them. The king was very angry, so he sent his soldiers, who killed those murderers and burnt down their city. Then he called his servants and said to them, My wedding feast is ready, but the people I invited did not deserve it. Now go to the main streets and invite to the feast as many people as you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, good and bad alike, and the wedding hall was filled with people. The king went in to look at the guests and saw a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? the king asked. But the man said nothing. Then the king told the servants, Tie him up hand and foot, and throw him outside in the dark. There he will cry and grind his teeth. And Jesus concluded, Many are invited, but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Those three parables are really the climax of what might be seen as the first set of exchanges between Jesus and the religious leaders in Holy Week. After Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and the cleansing of the temple when Jesus overthrew the tables of the money changers, the religious leaders had questioned Jesus' authority in acting in this way. And Jesus, in effect, replies by telling them this series of three parables. Each one builds on the previous one. And so I want to briefly look back at those three parables that I've just read. The first one is the parable of the two sons. It's a simple exchange between a father who owns a vineyard and his two sons. He asks the first one to go and work in the vineyard. The son says he doesn't want to, but later changes his mind and goes. The father similarly asks the second son also to go and work in the vineyard. This son says he will, but then he doesn't go. 
Jesus then invites the religious leaders to answer the question as to which son did what his father wanted. They answer correctly that it was the first one. But then Jesus applies the parable against them by saying that those people are the tax collectors and prostitutes who believed and followed John the Baptist, whereas they had not. And so it would be those people who would be entering the kingdom of God, kingdom of God ahead of the religious leaders. The parable is a lesson to us, as well as the religious leaders of Jesus' day, that what really matters is not appearing to say and do the right things, but in reality doing so. The second parable is that of the tenants in the vineyard. This parable, like the first one, also involves a vineyard owner, but it is much wider in scope than the first parable in several ways. Firstly, we are told about all the hard work and preparation and care that the vineyard owner has put into the setting up of the vineyard. He planted it, put a fence around it, dug a hole for the wine press, and built a watchtower. All of this is meant to convey the vineyard owner, who of course represents God, and his love and care for his vineyard, his creation. Not just at the outset, but continually. Secondly, we're told that the vineyard owner, however, goes on a journey. And so there is a recognition of not only what many may have felt in Jesus' day, but indeed many have felt ever since, including today. That we are, to use the image of the parable, living in a vineyard without the presence of its owner. Where is God? Many may ask. And the parable recognises the seeming absence of the owner from the vineyard, and indeed the possibility that this journey that he was on was a long one, that it would, that would involve a long absence. Thirdly, of course, the, the fact that the vineyard owner has gone on a journey, particularly a long-lasting one, means that despite the owner's expectation that his tenants would produce a crop of fruit for him, that they would rightfully hand over to him in the future, perhaps not unsurprisingly, the tenants act differently. Instead, we're told they kill the owner's servants who come to collect the fruit. And by that, Jesus was almost certainly referring to the Old Testament prophets all the way through to John the Baptist, who had recently been killed. Finally, the owner sends his son, but the tenants kill him believing that they can take over the vineyard. Now at this point we might think to ourselves, how could Jesus' listeners not have realised that when he referred to the owner's servants being killed, that he was talking about the Old Testament prophets, and that of course when he referred to the owner of the vineyard son, that he was referring to himself, and therefore prophesying his death, which of course was, as we know, to take place only a few days afterwards, as this is set in Holy Week. But before we become too critical of Jesus' listeners for failing to understand the parable, we must face the hard question, as indeed the religious leaders had to, of how we as tenants in God's vineyard today are looking after what he has entrusted to us, whilst he may appear to be away on a long journey. Are we producing the appropriate fruit to give to him? As with the first parable, Jesus invites the religious leaders to answer the question as to what the owner of the vineyard will do with the tenants. Again, they answer correctly, not realising that they are pronouncing their own judgement. He will certainly kill those evil men, they answered and let the vineyard out to other tenants who will give him his share of the harvest at the right time. 
The application of the first parable is repeated in the second. And so I tell you, added Jesus, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce the proper fruits. And so we, like them, are faced with a question as to whether we are responding appropriately to what God has entrusted to our care and producing the proper fruit. And so we come to the third parable of the wedding feast. This parable has parallels with the previous one, but the stakes are raised higher. Instead of a vineyard owner whose son is introduced later on in the parable, in this one we have a king whose son is centre stage from the outset as the king has prepared a wedding feast for him. The fact that the context shifts from a vineyard to a wedding feast also raises its significance and resonates with the use of the image as a picture of the heavenly banquet at the end of time. Interestingly, the king has already issued the invitations to the feast. But when his servants tell those who are invited that the feast is ready, they refuse to come. And as in the previous parable, we're told they kill the servants. The king therefore instructs the servants to invite anyone that they can find, even on the street corners, both good and bad alike so that the wedding hall will be filled. The parable finishes with a strange incident. We're told in verse 11. The king went in to look at the guests and saw a man who was not wearing wedding, who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The king asked him. But the man said nothing. Then the king told the servants, tie him up hand and foot and throw him outside in the dark. Well, what's going on here it all sounds very strange. But it's, in, it's really no different from what Jesus has been saying throughout these parables. And indeed the challenge that we all face today from them. Although the parables were clearly a challenge to, relig to religious leaders of Jesus' day, they can also be a challenge to us, where we, like them, fail to respond to the Father's request to work in the vineyard, or to give him his share of the harvest at the right time, or even simply to respond to his invitation by coming to the wedding feast. The parables also challenge the new tenants in the vineyard and those on the street corner invited to the wedding feast. They also have to produce the proper fruit or wear the appropriate wedding clothes to the feast. In other words, all of us, whether the original tenants or invitees to the feast or new ones, need to respond by, by producing proper fruit of changed lives lived as God would have us live, and responding by joyfully accepting his invitation to the wedding feast of his son Jesus. May God help each one of us to live our lives in the way that Jesus asks and indeed challenges us to in the light of these parables, so that we may one day sit down with him at that wedding feast. In heaven. Amen. We're now going to sing a song that reflects the Father's love for us in sending Jesus. Uh, we're going to uh, have the song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. And if you're at home, please do join in with the words on the screen as those of us in church worship silently to the song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. i 
video about our shoebox appeal for this year. Uh, but before we do that, I'm going to uh, read a, a notice that uh, Diane uh, has in regard to that. So this year we are supporting Link to Home Christmas shoebox appeal, making shoeboxes of essential items and gifts for the poorest and most marginalised families and the elderly in Eastern Europe. If you would like to support this but cannot commit to a whole box, any separate items from the list can be taken to church or collected on request, enabling more boxes to be made. Alternatively, you can give money so additional items can be bought. There are leaflets and item lists on the board in church, or one can be delivered to you or accessed from the Link to Hope website. The last date for bringing boxes or items to church is Sunday the 1st of November. And if anyone has any uh, questions, if you would like to uh, give Di a ring, then uh, she'll be able to answer them for you. And all that information that I've just mentioned uh, can be seen on the church website and Facebook page as well. So now we're going to watch the video of the shoebox appeal and then straight after that, Steve will lead us in our prayers. Every year, Link to Hope takes thousands upon thousands of shoeboxes filled with gifts to some of the most impoverished communities in Eastern Europe. Every single one of these boxes tells its own unique story. A story that might begin with a family somewhere in the UK packing a shoebox with everyday items. 
and ends as a message of love and hope to a family or elderly person in a poor village in Romania, Bulgaria, Moldova or Ukraine. Some of these shoebox stories have led to opportunities to start and develop education and social care projects in these poor communities where there is such acute need. Sometimes a shoebox can reveal the most desperate need. Volunteers delivering shoeboxes in a village in Moldova found Maria, a 74-year-old woman sleeping on the dirt floor of her freezing home. Seeing her need, linked to Hope were able to buy her a bed, blankets and pillows which they delivered to her house. On another day, a shoebox was delivered to a family grieving for their baby who had just died due to the cold and their inability to heat the one room they lived in. This family has now been rehoused by funds raised by Link to Hope supporters in a purpose-built container home. These stories and the people they affect simply wouldn't have been known about without shoeboxes. The power of a shoebox can change lives. So this year, when you pack a shoebox with small and precious gifts, remember that it will become yet another story of love and hope sent from far away, and that it could help change the lives of those in desperate need. Thank you, Tim. In these, the most uncertain of times, we can be assured of our Lord's blessing. I look to the hills, but my help comes from the Lord. He will not let me stumble, and he watches over me when I sleep. The Lord keeps me from harm now and forever. We have been invited to follow him. We must answer the invitation. As we sit quietly, let us look up to the Lord. I pray that I shall meet the Lord Jesus in person. We pray for our church that the restrictions on gatherings will soon be set aside and we can use the building to gather in large numbers. In the midst of this pandemic, we have started an Alpha course for new members that they may ask questions about the Christian faith. We anticipate, uh, anticipate a further course starting in the new year. We are so grateful to the Lord for this new set of opportunities which has presented itself. Our membership is growing. Yes, our membership is growing in the midst of this pandemic. And we thank Jesus for having so much faith in us as a church to proclaim your gospel. We ask for this blessing on our new PCC members. Please give them wisdom to follow your will. 
We are pleased that our family, friends and our church are using technology to, to keep in touch. And we thank God for the ingenuity of our people. We thank you for the reopening of the ARC soft play and we pray that our members of staff will remain safe and well. New members will find it welcoming and a safe place in the midst of the storm. Lord Jesus, please keep safe those vulnerable members of our parish, that they will be cared for and their needs met. We pray for the caring professionals, especially our frontline NHS staff. We pray for those members who are ill, Ann and Ted, Harry, Bill, Carol, Dolly, Elaine, Jeff and Maureen, Josie, John, Lynn and Ron, Pam, Paul, Owen, Ronnie, Stephen, Sam, Sylvia and Violet. We ask for a speedy recovery of those people and we give them thanks. We give thanks for those we know who have recovered. We thank you for answering our prayers. Prayers represent a real response in this virus. We are aware of some who are anxious and fearful, and we ask that they will be lifted up. We pray for their families that they, at a distance, are able to send their love and also explain the love of the Lord Jesus. We pray for more interaction with the elderly, especially those who find themselves at a distance from their family and friends. We appreciate our friends. We ask for health and continued employment for them. And we thank you for our own friendships overseas. We pray for our school children and teachers, also university students and lecturers, that they will learn in this strange teaching environment. We continue to pray for families that rely on food banks, that they will have fresh air, warmth and sufficient food. We appreciate that the virus cases are rising and we pray for new treatments or a vaccine. We pray that this will be found soon. We continue to pray for the health and well-being of our royal family, members of parliament and all bishops, including our own bishops, Viv and Lee. Please show our leaders how to proceed, whether they be government or church ministers, army, police, school or church leaders. Show them how to bring our country through this. And as we face another week of restrictions, keep us safe and our friends close. Consider our distress and suffering and forgive all our sins. Protect us and save us from defeat. We come to you for safety. Amen. Thank you very much, Steve. We're going to continue in prayer, with a special prayer for today. Let us pray. God, our judge and saviour, teach us to be open to your truth and to trust in your love, that we may live each day with confidence in the salvation which is given through Jesus Christ our Lord. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our final song this morning is the song, The Splendour of the King. Again, please do join in at home as we worship silently in church to the song, The Splendour of the King. in that song and thank you to everyone who's been involved in this service for the music group earlier on uh, for Steve doing the prayers and Di for the shoebox appeal and also of course Katie, Katie and Sam in uh, pulling everything together and thank you to all of you for either being here in church this morning or watching us at home and joining in on either Facebook or YouTube it's been good to share together in worship this morning next week will be a cafe church service live here in church so please do join us uh, for that either in church or at home it'd be good to join together again next Sunday we're going to close this morning with the words of the blessing 
The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always.